So um, in esophageal cancer, unlike colon, we don't have a national screening program, and our knowledge, I would say, generally lags behind that of the colon. And so what I thought I'd do is, rather than focusing the whole talk on, on screening and surveillance, I would talk to you a bit about what's coming out of the sequencing data and how we might be using that to subclassify our patients and think about personalised therapy, and then go on and talk a bit about um, detection of Barrett's, which I'll explain to you as a precursor to esophageal cancer and risk stratification. So just a few introductory uh, notes about esophageal adenocarcinoma. So there are two main types of cancer of the esophagus. One is squamous cell cancer. So the esophagus is a squamous-lined organ, like the skin, and squamous cell cancer tends to occur towards the upper part of the esophagus, associated particularly with um, smoking and, and high alcohol intake, and it's particularly common in the east. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is a glandular cancer occurring near the junction between the stomach, and this is the type that we've seen really rapidly increasing, particularly in white men, in Western countries. So this is data from the US, but our UK data exactly models this in terms of the rapid increase in incidence, up to sixfold in the last 30 years um, in the UK, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. And this just shows you the incidence um, on a log scale, so we can separate it out, separate it out for wet men versus women, blacks and whites, and you'll see that white men <coughs> have the highest um, incidence rate than black men, white women, and black women. <clears throat> and it's a, a pretty miserable disease. So most of our patients present really quite late. The five-year overall survival is 13%. And for those patients that present at a stage that we think we're going to put them down a curative pathway, which is about 38% on this last uh, August audit, um, then we can improve the five-year survival up to around 40%. So this just gives you some idea of the, the UK statistics. So overall survival at five years, 13%. On a curative pathway, 40%. But if we catch it early, then we can really do much better, as you'll see on this uh, kaplan meier curve. So patients at stage one, we can very often cure them of their disease. So that's really the holy grail about this disease. Can we diagnose it earlier and do better for our patients? <clears throat> and diagnosing it earlier is worth thinking about because actually we know quite a bit about the natural history in terms of the histopathology at least um, and the stages that occur. So as I said, the, the squamous esophagus is the natural lining of the esophagus. Here's the junction with the stomach. This is an endoscopy view looking down towards the stomach here. Here's a tongue of Barrett's esophagus, glandulined epithelium with a hallmark of intestinal metaplasia. And this is called Barrett's after the surgeon that discovered it. And that can then progress in a small proportion of patients. And I should emphasize it's a small proportion of patients with Barrett's that will progress to cancer through dysplasia to adenocarcinoma. On the other hand, the majority of our patients that present de novo with esophageal adenocarcinoma would have come through a Barrett sequence. It would just never have been diagnosed. So that's the challenge. Diagnosing the Barrett's, but identifying which of those people with Barrett's are truly at high risk of developing cancer because the majority with Barrett's will never get a cancer. And the other reason why I think identifying Barrett's is much more important these days is because we have excellent treatments now for treating early cancer confined to the mucosa and, and maybe the, the surface submucosal layers. So in the past, we used to send all of these patients, even if they had just dysplasia, to esophagectomy. Thankfully, that has passed. And now we can treat these patients with early disease entirely endoscopically, usually as an outpatient-based procedure. So we can treat them by removing the early cancer with an endoscopic mucosal resection, and we can ablate or burn off the Barrett's with techniques like radiofrequency ablation. There are now two randomized controlled trials for high-grade and low-grade dysplasia showing superiority um, of ablation therapy compared to just watching and surveying these patients. So now that we can do something about it, we have a reason to try and diagnose Barrett's. So here are the questions which I'm going to address briefly this morning. Can we sub subclassify esophageal adenocarcinoma to inform therapy? There is currently no molecular targeted therapy in routine use in a curative setting for esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is, is pretty... Well, we need to change it. Um, how do we detect undiagnosed Barrett's and how can we risk stratify Barrett's so we really only worry about those people truly at increased risk? So um, our knowledge has been increasing thanks to sequencing technology, and this was the first um, paper that came out of the TCGA project in the States. 
from Adam Bass's group, and they did mainly exome sequencing on a cohort. And, um, you know, on the one hand, we've learned an awful lot more through sequencing, but we've also learned what we knew already, um, which is that P53 mutations are by far and away the most recurrent mutations in this cancer type. After that, we have a long tail of mutations I can show you, but we didn't find lots of sort of previously unknown new driver gene mutations cropping up commonly in this cancer, which I guess was a disappointment. Um, P16 is commonly lost and actually lost quite early. Um, and in all the studies, um, if you look in cancer, lost in at least 12% of cases. And this was data that came out of our own International Cancer Genome Consortium project being done here in the UK, a multi-centre study, um, showing this long tail of, of mutations. And as the sample size increases, this precise list is sort of changing a bit, but the tail continues to be very long. So very common loss of P53. That's, that's point mutation and lot of heter loss of heterozygosity. And then a long tail of these other mutations. And pretty much any of your favourite cancer genes will be on the list. So very heterogeneous. But this is data that's come out of our latest paper from the ICGC, looking now at a larger number of patients, 129 patients. And we have data now for nearly 500 cases. And the picture really looks very, very much like this landscape. So if you have, look at small, what we call small-scale alterations here, which, by which I mean point mutations and small insertions and deletions, and compare it to large-scale chromosomal rearrangements, then we can see that large-scale alterations dominate. So this is really a cancer dominated by copy number alterations, amplifications, losses, chromosomal rearrangements, rather than recurrent point mutations in particular uh, oncogenes. So of course a lot of these oncogenes are then incorporated in amplifications, for example, um, of these genes. So I just want to talk about therapy for a few minutes, and if we look at the overview of the portfolio of trials out there, we're doing a lot of traditional chemotherapy and chemoradiotherapy followed by surgery. That's the mainstay still for our patients. In terms of our trials, the majority of them so far have been looking really at receptor tyrosine kinase um, inhibition, and then a smattering of other, other, cancer, uh, other uh, therapy types. But by and large, as I've said, they've all been pretty disappointing, and none of these therapies have been adopted currently into the mainstream of treatment for this tumour. So we're still using, in a curative setting, setting, chemotherapy plus radiotherapy followed by surgery. And why are the treatments failing in a lot of these trials? So this is from the um, latest ICGC data. So each patient here is a column. And what we've done here is just summarise the gains and losses for the receptor tyrosine kinases and the downstream pathways. And all I want you to notice is it's very heterogeneous, but there are multiple co-amplifications of more than one receptor tyrosine kinase for a given patient. And even if there's not a co-amplification at the receptor level, then often there's dysregulation downstream. So for most patients at more than one point in the pathway of a given receptor tyrosine kinase, there's a dysregulation. So even if you come in with your single drug against a single receptor tyrosine kinase, then it's likely to fail because the dysregulation is rather more complicated than that. So we need to be thinking much more about combined therapies or an alternative approach. So this just uh, summarizes that data. So if you think about proportion of cases with co-amplification of receptor tyrosine kinase and something downstream, that's 42.9%. If you look at just co-amplification at receptor level, that's nearly 40%. So, you know, over 80% of patients are accounted for by this complex alterations in these pathways. Um, so when we were scratching our heads trying to think about how we could subclassify adenocarcinoma from the latest sequencing data, given it's so heterogeneous, to make sense and come up with some new therapy ideas, um, we, we found more traction through looking at signatures than looking at specific genes or pathways. So this is just another way of looking at the data. So when you're looking at sequencing data, rather than having a gene-centric view, one can simply say, OK, let's look at the base changes throughout the whole genome. And this is where whole genome sequencing is more useful than exome data. So in the ICGC, we've taken a whole genome approach rather than restricting the analysis to exomes. 
and then you really have strong statistical power to do these kind of computations. So you have different sorts of um, exposures or environmental insults, um, things that happen over life that may alter um, gene mutations, gene bases. So for example, you might have something that's a weak but constant mutational process. I mean, aging, I guess, is something which happens all, you know, to all of us inevitably. And that causes a particular uh, signature in the genome that you can then link back to aging. You may start smoking here. That's going to be quite a strong mutational process. And at a certain point, if you stop, you will then stop accumulating mutations from smoking. And you can actually trace back particular signatures to these insults. So you can find a smoking signature, for example. You might even be able to tell which brand of cigarette you smoked and how many a day. So they, these, these insults leave a very particular kind of uh, mark. And these are some of the signatures. These have been characterized um, particularly by Alexandrov um, and Mike Stratton at the Sanger Center, and they've identified a large number of different signatures, some of which are really not understood in terms of what causes them, some of which are quite well understood. So nearly all cancers have what we call this aging signature with the C to T base change. We also see BRCA type signatures. So you might see this um, if you've got a germline mutation in BRCA, but also through somatic alterations in BRCA and genes in BRCA pathways. It doesn't have to be BRCA itself. This is what we think might be a signature due to acid and bile exposure, which is the trigger for Barrett's and esophageal adenocarcinoma. And this is a signature which is seen very commonly in our esophageal adenocarcinoma cases and not in most other cancers, occasionally seen in pancreas. S18, we see in our esophageal cases, also been noted in the stomach. So six signatures overall came out of esophageal adenocarcinoma data. And despite all the heterogeneity that we see on a per gene basis, if you just think about which of the six, six signatures is dominating in a patient's cancer with esophageal adenocarcinoma, we actually find that patients group themselves into three fairly homogeneous groups. And furthermore, if we take more than one sample from a patient, that's what these examples are down here, that dominant signature holds true for several different BARPs is taken for that mutation. Whereas if you start looking and seeing if there's a, uh, I don't know, a combination of particular mutations like P53, uh, B2, um, KRAS or something in a particular BARPSI, you'll find quite a lot of heterogeneity. If you take another BARPSI, you won't find the same combination. But the signatures seem to be fairly homogeneous within the patients and subgroup the patients. So we see three main subgroups of patients then, based on the dominant signatures present. So those with a dominant, that's why it's dark red here, S17, or acid-like signature. Those with a more dominant aging and S18-like signature. And those that we've called DDR-impaired, I'll show you why, with more of a BRCA and apovet type signature. These groups are not really um, determined by P53 status. Most of them are mutant across all groups. Um, there's a slight preponderance of receptor tyrosine kinase uh, mutations in the um, CTA dominant group. But really, these groups are independent of mutations in particular genes. If you look at the pathways dysregulated in these different subgroups, then they all have P53 pathway dysregulation, as you'd expect. So the longer the spike on this kind of target diagram, the more dysregulated that pathway and the greater proportion of the patients. But what we were um, interested in was this, what we've now called DNA damage repair impaired uh, group, where we see this spike here for genes related to homologous recombination. So very, very few of these patients have a germline mutation in BRCA or a somatic mutation in BRCA. So via other pathways, they have dysregulation of um, homologous recombination. So I want to draw your attention to the mutational burden. So if we just assess the overall mutational burden in these patients, then this is why we've called this the mutagenic group, but this group with an S17 or acid-like signature has a higher mutational burden than the other subgroups. And that caught our attention because we were thinking about novel therapy strategies and there's a lot of excitement at the moment, as you'll all be aware, about immunotherapy, which seems to work better in patients with a high mutational burden in patients with a, a high infiltration of CD8 positive lymphos um, CD8 lymphocytes. And if you look at our three subgroups based on the signatures, 
at neoantigen presentation and CD8 infiltration, then we see in the mutagenic subgroup there's a slight increase in the mutagenicity, the mutation burden, the neoantigen presentation, and the proportion having a high infiltration of CD8 positive T cells. So this was really a, a paper published based on the informatics and analy analyzing the sequencing data. We did do some in vitro experiments using new cell lines, new enough that we could derive the signatures, because once the cells have been in culture for ages, you can't recapitulate the signatures, and a new organoid. But um, I'd say that these um, therapy suggestions are hypothesis for testing to hopefully stimulate some more work in the field, but they're not proven. Um, so what we suggest is that in the mutagenic group with this high mutational burden, one might think about um, immunotherapy. We also did some, data, some work to suggest that um, CHEK1 and WE1 inhibition might be useful. I've got time to go into that, but that, that data was quite striking on the in vitro work is in the paper. Um, this group, one might conjecture, might be more responsive to irradiation and PARP inhibition, given the pathways involved. Um, and this one, it's hard to come up with a new strategy, but given um, the slight predominance of receptorizing kinase aberration, but here with a, a multiple therapy strategy targeting more than one receptorizing kinase, as I mentioned earlier, because you generally have dysregulation at more than one receptor or level in the pathway. So um, I think this is a different way of thinking about the data, um, and hopefully it will, will stimulate some uh, more research and thinking about how we can advance from our current rather de depressing uh, therapy strategy for these patients, which doesn't seem to be very successful. So in the, in the last part of the talk, I just wanted to talk about diagnosis then of Barrett's and risk stratification. So this is the sequence that I showed you before. So most patients with Barrett's, 80 plus percent are undiagnosed, walking around in the population, taking their proton pump inhibitors that they never see a GP for, they just buy them at the supermarket or at the garage, they never get a diagnosis. If you do see a GP with heartburn, they may or may not refer you for an endoscopy. So how could we go about finding them? So originally we had an idea of trying to do a non-diagnostic test and, um, and using a panel of genes, say, to identify patients with Barrett's and where they are in the stages to dysplasia. Before, I showed you the data for adenocarcinoma with the red bars, and we expected that we would see a particular kind of vogelgram of mutations as you go from Barrett's to dysplasia. But what we saw was this much more surprising heterogeneous picture where most of the mutations that we're finding in the cancer you can find in Barrett's esophagus. Now, these patients have been really highly selected. So the patients with Barrett's and the grey bars are people with never dysplastic Barrett's whom we've been following for 10 years. They were completely stable and benign. So it's a very mutated phenotype, even in the metaplastic setting. So this really caused us to scratch our heads and was very uh, surprising to us at the time. P53, on the other hand, you only really see mutations in P53 if you have got high-grade dysplasia or cancer. SMAD4 is interesting because we only have seen it in the invasive setting. But other than that, most mutations will occur in Barrett's as well as the cancer. So in terms of a biomarker to distinguish dysplasia, we're back to P53. But as I told you, this is a copy number driven disease. So measuring copy number might also be very important for risk stratification. <clears throat> now this comes back to Simon's PhD. Um, so we know that Barrett's is, is polyclonal. So where you'll take your, bi your biopsy from is going to, to determine the kind of uh, combination of mutations that you find. But what we know is really ubiquitous to Barrett's that's becoming invasive is these copy number changes. And this is just to highlight this point. This was patients where we'd taken a sample from the cancer and from the adjacent Barrett's. And if you just look in the Barrett's, copy number is very flat. But as soon as you get into the cancer, you see this is all data from 30 patients piled up. Um, they all have copy number alterations. And furthermore, this is data from the Broad group looking at the copy number and showing that about a third of patients with adenocarcinoma here have genome doubling with the black outline, which sometimes occurs in Barrett's. And this may be an important trigger for cancer development. And indeed, this is data from Brian Reed, who's been working on Barrett's and progression to adenocarcinoma for, for many years. Um, 
who first described the P53 loss early in the disease process, showing again that copy number alteration is very important as you move towards cancer. And in their data, it seemed that about two years before the diagnosis of the cancer, you could start to really see an increase in copy number. So this is a nice model of cancer progression. I'm not sure it's as simple as this, um, but it's a nice way of thinking about it. Whereas in this scenario, you have progressive tumour suppressor loss until you get enough instability to develop your cancer. Whereas in an alternative model, you might get an early P53 loss and genome dou doubling, which would trigger oncogene amplification and perhaps an accelerated route to cancer. And people over the years have identified and suggested a number of different biomarkers for risk stratification based on immuno panels, fish panels, and so on. But they all require doing an endoscopy and taking a biopsy. <coughs> And so when you're really thinking about screening in the population, we've taken a view that you need something much simpler, potentially more cost-effective, that could just be done by the patient coming to the GP surgery. And then when you've got your sample without an endoscopy, then you can do some kind of assay. So um, this is what we've tried to come up with, something applicable on a population basis that would minimise sampling bias with an objective readout that doesn't rely on endoscopy and biopsy. And so this is the device that we've been developing. It's a sponge compressed into a capsule um, so that you collect cells non-endoscopically. I'll show you how it works. And because you collect cells on, in this sponge along the whole esophagus as you withdraw it, you should have less sampling bias than you get with a biopsy. And the idea is to make the patient side of it as simple, as trivial as possible, and then be sophisticated in the lab. So this is a um, capsule here on a string. You simply swallow it down with some water. You feel a bit of a wally with the string hanging out, but it's not going to be for very long. You swallow it down, it goes to the top of the stomach. The capsule dissolves and out pops this sponge which has been compressed inside the capsule, and that just takes just a few minutes. The nurse then pulls the whole thing out, and as it comes back along its passage, it'll collect some cardia cells from the top of the stomach, Barrett's if it's there, and then cells from along the rest of the esophagus as it's pulled out. So you end up with about a million cells on this specimen with a test that takes just over five minutes. So it is ridiculously simple, that's the whole point. And then you put the sponge into a specimen pot and send it to a lab and you spin off the cells which you can then use for your analysis. So we've tried to um, be as objective as possible with um, the biomarkers. And this is a diagnostic biomarker for Barrett's. It's an immunotest for trefoil factor 3 which is specific to the intestinal phenotype of Barrett's. And you simply score it positive or negative. So this is the kind of specimen that we get from the sponge. We've spun the cells down so it looks almost like a biopsy. Even if you just have one positive goblet cell for TFF3, we score that as positive. So it's a binary test. And we've done data now, studies on over 2,000 patients. It's very safe. Patients find it preferable to endoscopy, generally speaking. It's very simple and it's pretty accurate. Always want it to be better, but the latest study with the latest uh, Medtronic made device sensitivity of 95%, specificity in all the studies holding up to 92 to 94%. The longer the Barrett's, the more likely you are, of course, the higher the sensitivity to detect the Barrett's. How am I for time, Simon? Just a few more minutes. So it's all very good diagnosing Barrett's with TFF3, but then what would we do? Would we have to put all of those patients to endoscopy? That's not really what we want you've still got the problem then of a burden on endoscopy, you haven't restratified very well. So what we'd want to do on the same sample, if it was TFF3 positive, is to do a second tier test to see if you could risk stratify. So P53, we've already seen, is by far and away the most recurrent mutation. And um, most of the mutations occur on the DNA binding domain. You can very well detect um, mutations in P53 in the cytosponge with similar efficacy as on a biopsy. And um, this study has just been published just last week, I think, in Lancet Gastro-Hepatology, um, in which we took 468 patients with Barrett's from our latest trial and saw if on the same sample that we used for TFF3 we could risk stratify. So we have taken into account the clinical factors, which have a small usefulness, age, BMI, and Barrett's length, but also taken into account the P53 status, copy number, and whether the cells look atypical by a pathologist. 
So the 468 patients were the discovery cohort, and what we decided was really important was to have a highly confident test for patients at low risk. Because if you can really be confident that a patient is not going to get cancer and spare them endoscopy and just say, come back and swallow the cytosponge again in another three or five years, then I think that would be really useful to gastroenterologists. It is more difficult to get a very high confident, high risk, you have got cancer test. So we end up with three groups. This group here accounts for over a third of patients and it's very, very good. So when right, nearly all of the time, when we validated it in a 65 um, independent patient panel, we got one patient wrong, all of them correct in the discovery. The moderate and high risk group, we have more uh, um, heterogeneity in this moderate risk group with some patients with high grade and uh, quite a few negatives. The high risk group is again pretty, pretty um, sensitive and specific. So 59 high grades were classified as high risk and nine um, Patients without dysplasia were classified as high risk. Similar data in the validation. So if you're low risk on this panel, we can be pretty confident for the patient that you really are at low risk, you don't need to have an endoscopy. If you're moderate or high risk, then we would recommend endoscopy. We think we can improve on this further, but I think it's a step in the right direction where all patients with Barrett's currently go through multiple endoscopies, multiple biopsies. Most of them will never get a cancer. So currently our algorithm is looking something like this, that we would screen if you have heartburn symptoms with a cytosponge test. Most patients would be TFS3 negative. They can be reassured and discharged. If it's positive, then you go on and do the risk stratification panel. Over a third will be low risk and just can go into further cytosponge monitoring. Moderate or high risk would go into endoscopy for confirmation and treatment as required. So how far has this got towards clinical adoption? Well, we're just about to do what I hope will be the final primary care study for this. Um, before we can go and discuss it with NICE. Um, it's actually now 9,000 patients to be approached, um, 4,000 patients to be randomised, 2,000 will swallow the cytosponge. Um, and what we want to see is compare cytosponge with uh, usual practice for patients with heartburn to check that we diagnose more Barrett's in the cytosponge arm and to look at the acceptability and the health economics. So this trial is in setup it's with ethics at the moment and should start in January. Um, and uh, just a note of caution, really. I mean, it, it's, it's fantastically interesting doing work on diagnostics. It takes an awful long time to get from concept and first data towards the clinic. So we've been working on this for a depressing number of years, 15 years or something, for something incredibly simple. And even now, we're still on an, you know, another big trial um, to potentially take it to NICE. So, you know, drugs take a long time. So, unfortunately, do diagnostics. Um, so don't be put off. We need meet more people working on diagnostics, but it's not a quick, um, you know, goal. So in summary then, sort of bringing the data together, Barrett's esophageal adenocarcinoma is quite heterogeneous at a genomics level. Um, Barrett's can evolve to cancer through several different pathways, probably. I, th I think of it as a punctuated evolution. Um, but Barrett's collects many mutations but can still remain very benign for many years. But P53 alteration is clearly, criti clearly critical in the pathway to cancer and copy number alteration uh, is almost inevitable. So understanding the natural history, I think, will in time lead us to clinical strategies for early cancer detection. But it's not, it is complicated. It's not straightforward to see how to do that. But I think we are making progress. And um, because of the, the complexity of the genome and multiple dysregulation of receptor tyrosine kinase pathways, we do need different ways of thinking about new personalised therapy <laughs> algorithms and not just one drug for a patient, probably. Um, and so I think uh, with the data that's coming out through sequencing, hopefully we can really try and improve our strategies beyond standard chemotherapy. So thank a lot of people who've done this work through a truly multidisciplinary effort um, too many people to, to mention by name, but truly grateful to all of the team. And this is us picking up Gastro Team of the Year at the BMJ Awards for the Cytosponge work um, earlier this year. And all our funders, thank you very much. <laughs>